Hi, it's uh, Professor Alan Edelman, and uh, my little assistant here, you can see falling asleep, is Philip the Corgi. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the Spring 2020 class. It's a half class, a half semester course, six unit course, uh, 6S083, uh, also 18S190. Six is uh, MIT speak for computer science, um, actually EECS, electrical engineering of computer science. 18 is MIT speak for uh, math. And this course is an introduction to computational thinking. And because uh, it is the spring of 2020 and many of us are at uh, home sheltered, um, avoiding other people, social distancing is sort of the key phrase of the times. Um, and so it seems very appropriate to apply our computational thinking approaches to uh, the coronavirus and, and the associated disease COVID-19. So uh, many of the lectures will be taught by my colleague, Dave Sanders, who you'll get to know very well. Uh, he, in my opinion, is a superb professor. He uh, really understands the connections between uh, mathematics, computation, and how you express it in the Julia programming language. Uh, so I think you'll uh, all in for quite a treat. So just by way of the introduction, as I was saying, the, uh, the we are right now, I'm recording this, uh, the class is starting on March 30th, 2020. We're in the middle of a world pandemic. Um, just in case this video gets viewed, you know, maybe perhaps sometime far in the future, it's worth pointing out that, uh, that, that uh, Harvard and MIT rather early and then many other schools followed suit, um, basically shut down the campus really very quickly, it seems to us. Uh, there was uh, uh, just a week before where people were talking about whether we could even imagine that 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 uh, MIT could shut down, and, and many of my colleagues thought that it was it was it was almost you know un unlikely, un unheard of even. Um, but very quickly, uh, uh, MIT took the steps that that probably well certainly were the right steps, and uh, shut down classes and, and sent everybody home, uh, hopefully for to be safe and, and hopefully healthy. So if you look at the newspapers these days, I just picked a few from the New York Times and the, the Boston Globe, but you know, we're, there's tons and tons of data, tons and tons of statistics uh, for all sorts of, uh, you know, so you, one can watch all sorts of trends by country, by date, um, you know, lo looking at it in your local area. We're being swamped with lots of data and uh, probably every one of us is trying to sort of make heads or tails of, of all the data that we see. So uh, in, in this course, what we're going to try to do is put together you know, a real world modeling problem. I and mean, none seems much more important right now than, than the pandemic that we're experiencing. And think about how to combine mathematical ideas, computational modeling, computer science ideas, uh, and uh, express it in a programming language. And uh, we're going to use the Julia programming language, full disclosure, I am one of the founders of, of the Julia programming language. Uh, but more to the point, we think that this is, the, the Julia programming language is, is taking a leaning role, it seems, in, in uh, understanding this pandemic and, and also in lots of other modeling. Uh, and so it seems like the, the right thing to, 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 it seems like the right tool to use at this point. So uh, the course, by the way, is the official prerequisites for the course uh, are that students are familiar with a programming language like Python to begin with. It makes it a lot easier if you already know a programming language, uh, but uh, perhaps you could also learn it for the first time as well. So just to mention a few facts, uh, one seems, seems to see in the press a lot. There's a lot of discussion about the uh, R naught, here, let me move this out of the way. So there's this, this number R naught, which is some sort of average number, which is meant to represent how many people one person can infect. And so I guess I first learned about this number. I'm not an epidemiologist, neither is Dave and neither is Philip the Corgi, uh, but a lot of the math and, and computing that we've done already in the course applies, it fits perfectly to, 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 to the current events at hand. And so, uh, I first learned about R naught from this this mo movie Contagion. Uh, maybe some of you had seen it also. Uh, I put together a, a 
video link. If you haven't seen the explanation of Arnett from that movie, you can try to maybe copy the, the, the link and see it for yourselves. Um, but here you can see uh, here you can see a discussion of how the flu infected one person. Each, each one person would infect another person on average. Smallpox, it might be three. Uh, polio was four to six before it was er eradicated. Uh, and uh, the, the star says we call this number the R naught. Okay, and I wonder to this day why it looks like it's written like in the sort of latex -y format where you have R underscore zero. Um, but so that's the R naught. And uh, lots of people are solving differential equations right now to, to model. And so there are these so called compartmental models. And this is straight from the Wikipedia article. We're going to see that in this class. Uh, but what we do in, in these relatively simple models, we say that a person, we describe the pop, we, we, we divide the population into those that are susceptible, those that have been exposed but not yet infectious, those that are actually infectious, and then finally either recovered or removed from the system, perhaps because they've uh, no longer infectious, or, or I suppose perhaps because they've passed away. And so there's a differential equation that. Uh, models this. At the beginning, this differential equation tends to grow exponentially, and then it kind of becomes somewhat self-limiting, and it goes down. And so uh, differential equations are not particularly required for this class. We're going to explain the most important basic parts to you, uh, so you can um, see how these models go. There are other models as well. Uh, this, this SEIR that I just mentioned is a compartmental model. There are the simpler ones where you don't have the the exposed, you just have the SIR. Uh, you have uh, a number of other models as well. Um, here's just sort of a list of different models. Um, they're all somewhat related, they're all somewhat different, and it's all it's kind of interesting to see how they all work. Let me just conclude my little uh, introduction by talking about the fact that um, that when it comes to modeling, I guess I feel pretty strongly that uh, a model needs to be examinable. The, the source code has to be available. And that doesn't always happen in the real world. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about reproducible science. And quite frankly, the only real reproducible science, the only possible reproducible science, is when you have the code. It's, it's, I, I think it's, I've almost never seen a paper where if I just read every line of the paper, I know exactly what's happening. There, there's always details. There's always those little choices that compound upon each other that basically make a piece of software um, much, much more uh, a, a speck of what's going on than what a paper says. And so many, many papers, uh, ma many times researchers don't release their codes. Uh, nowadays, a lot more people are doing it. Uh, and, and it really makes a difference. And so uh, in the case of the coronavirus, there was this wonderful study out of Imperial College. I think the folks must have uh, scrambled and worked very hard to get the models out so uh, so leaders can make informed decisions. Um, but nonetheless, you know, without, uh, you know, w without in any way diminishing from the, the wonderful work they've done, um, I went looking to see if I could find the code because I wanted to play with it. And uh, I was pointed to this tweet by the uh, leader of the code, Neil Ferguson, who I'm told is uh, an amazing epidemiologist, a very talented fellow, uh, but he did point out that uh, he he did point out over here that that the code is old and he didn't really want to release it. Perhaps he was embarrassed. And uh, my colleague Stefan Karpinski, would I thought did the right thing. He said, "Why don't you just release the code and allow everybody else to work on it and, and put make it better?" And I think that is the right attitude these days. Uh, but to my best of my knowledge, that didn't happen. And um, another colleague pointed out, and I think this is also worth saying, that uh, he was still working hard in the midst from the fact that he himself was um, showing the, the symptoms of the coronavirus and developed a high fever, and he was self-isolating. And so um, I really can't, uh, you know, I, I, I'm actually pretty impressed that, that uh, under such circumstances he was still continuing to... to to work. Um, but to kind of, uh, my last slide for, for now is uh, the Julia language. I've noticed that it creates community. This It allows people of different areas to work together. And I think that uh, as we all are, 
you know, trying to see whatever it is we can all do to help. Um, it, it's very, very valuable to have a language where people can work together. So uh, there, there's communities within MIT and across the world. And now that you're taking this class, you, you too are part of that community. So I hope you enjoy the class.